on World News Tonight. Continuing chaos. Ukraine's capital Kyiv is taking cover as Russia's military onslaught continues to intensify, now causing major civilian casualties due to long-range attacks. Meanwhile, citizens find refuge underground to weather the storm. Global concern. As Russia continues to shield its citizens from external outlash, world leaders decry the events in Ukraine and gather with President Zelensky in hopes of lending a hand. The president still hopeful on peace talk success. More jabs. Pfizer introduces its latest defense against the COVID pandemic in the form of a fourth vaccine shot, focusing on the elderly, blaming waning immunity due to the rapid mutation of the strains. And vibrant festivities. India celebrates holy season with rainbows of shades coating the masses to mark their devotion to the festival of color. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. Today's coverage still begins with the updates on the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Ukraine capital city Kyiv is under heavy fire by Russian forces. However, these attacks are now causing more civilian damage than ever before as building houses and citizens are targeted in the onslaught. In wars, front lines are never clear. But now, Ukrainians are being targeted just for being in their homes. Russia shelled a building in the city of Kharkiv, burning the apartments of people trying to ride out the war. Russia attacked another apartment block in Kyiv, killing four. And this is what's left of a subway station here. But while Russia is breaking buildings, the will to fight and pull together remains strong. Upstairs, the station is ruined. But down below, Ukrainians are hiding from Russian attacks. In a parked subway car that's been her home for more than a week, Tanya heard the blast up above. In the corridor is Alina, her family, and three-year-old daughter, Anna. We're scared because no matter where you are hiding, the danger can follow you. Today, Ukraine's President Zelensky, who sharply criticized President Biden and NATO for not doing more to help Ukraine, accused the West of being Russian hypnotized by Russian aggression, aggression too worried about how like President Putin stands. will react, and making an impassioned plea to Canadian lawmakers for a no-fly zone. Can you imagine that? Cruise missiles are being falling down on your terrain, and your children are asking you, what happened? He got a three-minute standing ovation. But Russians never hear that message until last night when a producer rushed on the set of Russia's main newscast with a sign that said, no war, and don't believe the propaganda. The journalist was detained and given a small fine, but could face harsher penalties. She spoke outside court today. Other journalists are being silenced forever. Fox News announcing the death of cameraman Pierre Krzyzewski, a veteran of conflict zones, killed in the same attack that seriously wounded correspondent Benjamin Hall. A Ukrainian producer and translator working with the team, Oleksandra Kushinova, was also killed. She was 24 years old. The International Atomic Energy Agency said that power has been restored at Ukraine's Chernobyl nuclear power station. Meanwhile, Ukraine's state nuclear operator Energotem accused the Russian military of detonating ammunition at the Zaporozhye nuclear power plant station in the country's south. As the Russian army advances in Ukraine, it looks to have set its sights on the country's nuclear power stations. After first taking Chernobyl, Fears of nuclear disaster were raised when it shelled and captured Europe's largest nuclear power plant, Zaporizhia. On Thursday, Russian forces also attacked a nuclear research institute near Kharkiv, setting buildings on fire. If there's physical damage to the facility, it's possible that the fuel and radioactive elements would leak. In other words, the problem is the same as at nuclear power plants. Over half of Ukraine's power comes from 15 active reactors across four sites. There are also a handful of closed or unfinished plants like Chernobyl, which was decommissioned but is still contaminated after the 1986 nuclear disaster. Both Chernobyl and Zaporizhia are being maintained by its usual employees, taken hostage by Russian forces. With Ukraine being Europe's third most nuclear-reliant country, Russia may be seeking to control its key infrastructure.
this nuclear plant provides uh, approximately uh, 50% of the electricity in Ukraine, meaning that by this you deprive the Ukrainian forces of having some of their normal day-to-day, uh, -day, uh, daily use uh, of electricity. Before the invasion, Ukraine's nuclear industry was already largely dominated by Russia. But Kyiv had been looking to reduce its dependence, turning to the West for both technology and investment in its plants. Ukrainian troops are taking cover as more and more casualties arise from the conflict. Soldiers recuperate in the safety of temporary shelters and emergency care units, praying for an end to the violence. Some Ukrainian troops who have battled Russian forces have ended up at Mykolaiv Central A&E Hospital and are now receiving emergency care for their wounds. These soldiers were able to push back the Russians slightly from the regional capital, which they had been trying to seize. A Ukrainian soldier named Dima described his experience. We started to attack the enemy and came under fire. Our tank, or turret to be exact, stopped working. The others left without giving us warning. And then the Russian tanks came. We barely managed to get away. Another Ukrainian fighter, Artyom, spoke of the serious injury he suffered in battle. We did not manage to leave because we were hit with a shell exactly into my vehicle. My guys could jump out. They managed to get away. But I couldn't because half my leg was torn away. Then I got out, rolled over to my guys. We crawled to the road where our military picked us up, loaded us into a pickup and brought me to the hospital. Once stable, the Ukrainian troops are transported further west and away from the city of Mykolaiv, one of the first places attacked by Russian forces. It's still in the sights of the Russian army, which has pummeled the city with tank, artillery fire and airstrikes. Despite the current situation, Ukrainian President Zelensky is hopeful for progress at peace talks between the two countries. However, he reaffirmed that the country is not set on joining NATO at this time. Leader Volodymyr Zelensky struck a cautiously optimistic note over ongoing peace talks with Russia in a Wednesday video address. It is difficult but important as any war ends with an agreement. The meetings continue and, I am informed, the positions during the negotiations already sound more realistic. On Tuesday, Prime Ministers of the Czech Republic, Poland and Slovenia arrived in Kyiv. The first visit from foreign leaders since the crisis began. We are also here to tell you that you're not alone. Your fight is our fight and together we will prevail. Slava Ukraini. Glory to Ukraine, said Slovenia's Prime Minister Janez Jansa. The leaders arrived in the city hours after local authorities reported a deadly Russian airstrike. They reported bombardments that hit the capital before dawn and killed at least five people. Russia denies targeting civilians. Moscow has not captured any of Ukraine's 10 biggest cities since it invaded last month, seeding hope among Ukrainian officials who say the war could end sooner than expected. A possible point of compromise may be NATO. Zelensky said earlier Ukraine was prepared to accept security guarantees from the West that stopped short of its long-term goal of joining NATO. Russia sees any possibility of Ukraine joining NATO as a threat and has demanded guarantees it will never be a member. Also late on Tuesday, the White House announced that US President Joe Biden will make his first visit to Europe since Russia invaded to discuss the crisis. Biden is expected to announce an additional $800 million in security assistance to Ukraine. That's according to a White House official Russia calls its actions a special military operation to demilitarize and denazify Ukraine. Ukraine and Western allies call this a baseless pretext for a war of choice. Nine out of ten Ukrainians could be plunged into poverty if the war drags on, the UN has warned. Many residents are still sheltering from repeated Russian bombing, including Mariupol, the location of the worst humanitarian crisis where people are desperate for food and water. Ukraine's vice president confirmed that a convoy with supplies for the city had been hit at a nearby port. The UN says that just over 3 million people have now fled Ukraine. And according to a Monday estimate, over 600 civilians have been killed. 
Journalists on the ground have also lost their lives. Meanwhile, Britain is choosing to let Russia feel the squeeze as the country has announced it will stop exporting luxury goods from the country to Russia, including imposing major taxes on Russian imports. Britain said on Tuesday that it would ban exports of luxury goods to Russia, as well as imposing a new 35% tariff on Russian imports worth £900 million, or about $1.2 billion. The announcement is the latest in a series of economic sanctions announced by the government to punish Russian President Vladimir Putin for the conflict in Ukraine. Finance Minister Rishi Sunak said in a statement that the tariffs will further isolate the Russian economy from global trade. The government said the export ban would come into effect shortly and it would soon set out which products were affected, but added they would likely include high-end fashion, art and luxury vehicles. A number of British firms, including Jaguar Land Rover, Aston Martin and Burberry, have already said they are temporarily shutting their outlets in Russia or suspending the supply of goods. The government said the goods subject to the new tariffs had been chosen to minimise impact on Britain while maximising impact on the Russian economy. The goods include vodka, metals and fertilisers. The government also said it was cutting off all export finance support to Russia and Belarus, meaning it will no longer issue any new guarantees, loans or insurance for exports. Let's go into a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more World News. Welcome back to World News Tonight. Just a few weeks ago, the airline industry was at its lowest, but it seems that business is now booming in the sector as shares soar back to a high as a result of a major uptick of travel globally. Shares of U.S. airlines soared on Tuesday after the major carriers, including Delta, Southwest, United and American, all raised their revenue forecasts, saying travel demand has bounced back faster than expected. At a news conference in London, the CEOs of Delta and Virgin Atlantic said pent-up demand for international travel meant passengers were willing to pay higher fares, a sign airlines will be able to pass on surging fuel costs to customers. Fuel prices spiked last week to their highest level in more than a decade following Russia's invasion of Ukraine, which also forced the closure of vast swaths of airspace. Delta CEO Ed Bastian said he hadn't seen any impact at all in terms of reluctance to travel from U.S. travelers coming to Europe, adding that Delta had the busiest booking day in its history last week, even though many Asian routes remained suspended, and that he was seeing the strongest demand in his career. Virgin Atlantic CEO Shai Weiss said Virgin had seen a bit of a dip in demand after the Russian invasion, but that it had since recovered adding that while he could not predict how customers would respond to higher prices in the long term, for now it was seeing strong demand for premium leisure travel. Both airlines said they had seen a recovery in business class bookings, with Delta saying corporate travel was 60 percent back from 2019 levels, while Virgin's business bookings were at 50 percent of those levels. Following a harsh opposition from the Republicans, President Biden's nominee for the next top bank regulator, Sarah Bloom Ruskin, is bowing out from the race. The withdrawal occurred following Republicans fearing climate bias in her actions as chair. U.S. President Joe Biden's pick to become the top bank regulator at the Federal Reserve, Sarah Bloom Ruskin, withdrew from the nomination on Tuesday, just a day after a key Democratic senator said he would not support her effectively ending her chances of confirmation. Raskin's withdrawal was first reported by The New Yorker magazine, which said Raskin had submitted a letter of withdrawal to the White House. She had become the most contentious of Biden's five nominees to the Fed's Board of Governors for her stance on climate change. She faced strong opposition from Republicans who warned she might use the post to penalize bank lending to fossil fuel companies. It's not surprising there's bipartisan Senate opposition to such a radical nominee. Republicans on the Senate Banking Committee, which reviews appointments to the Fed, had blocked progress on other Fed board nominations. At one point, Republicans boycotted voting sessions over their objections to Raskin's nomination as vice chair for supervision. But the White House just yesterday held out hope Raskin and others might be confirmed. 
Well, there's enough support to move all five nominees through the committee. So we think the Republicans should show up so that they can vote them through the committee. Raskin's withdrawal could now clear the way for the Senate to act on the four remaining nominees, which include Jerome Powell for a second term as the central bank's chair. Pfizer has asked the FDA to authorize the emergency use of a second COVID-19 booster shot for older Americans. This comes as COVID cases are spiking in countries around the globe. Seeking emergency use authorization tonight confirms Pfizer has submitted new data to the FDA, hoping to greenlight a second COVID booster shot for Americans 65 and older. Citing waning immunity several months after a third dose, the company's CEO says a fourth shot would dramatically improve protection against infection. Pfizer's push comes as COVID cases spike in pockets of the globe. Cases in mainland China up 300. 77%. In the UK, infections have surged over 52%. Dr. Fauci attributes three major factors behind England's rise. Omicron subvariant BA2 is more transmissible, though not necessarily more severe. Relaxed mandates like no longer masking indoors also having an impact, as is waning immunity from vaccination or prior infection. Somalia is facing what it considers to be the worst ever drought in the region in over four decades. The severe weather is likely to cause millions to starve due to the unsuccessful rainy seasons. Tens of thousands now live on the outskirts of Bardeer, having fled the devastation wrought by Somalia's worst drought in more than four decades. Among them is 61-year-old Habiba Ma'au Iman. It hasn't rained on her farm in two years. Her crops have failed, her animals are dead. She says she's been here for 158 days without food or shelter, and that every day she goes to the town to knock on doors and beg, so her children can eat. The Horn of Africa region is facing its driest condition since 1981, according to the UN's World Food Programme after three consecutive rainy seasons failed. Most of those in need of help near Bader are women and children, said WFP country director El Khadir Daloum Mahmoud. Much rests on the success of rains this year. If they don't materialize in April, the WFP says more than four million Somalis will struggle to find food. 1.4 million children under five could be acutely malnourished by the end of the year. But the signs are not promising. Global weather patterns indicate the rains are likely to fail again this year, according to the Famine Early Warning System Network, which warns that the region could be heading for its worst drought on record. Welcome back to World News Tonight. For more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. The United Nations said in its first comprehensive human rights report since last year's coup that Myanmar's military has engaged in systematic human rights violations, some of them amounting to war crimes and crimes against humanity. The ever-forward container ship ran aground in the U.S. nearly a year after another ship run by the same company jammed Suez Canal, blocking traffic in one of the world's busiest waterways for six days. The Eiffel Tower has grown six metres after a new digital radio antenna was attached to the top of the Paris Monument. Following the action of the antenna, which was airlifted into place by helicopters, the tower now measures 330 metres tall. Part of a hill collapsed in northern Peru, burying at least 60 homes. According to local authorities, there had been no confirmed deaths, but rescue workers were on the scene searching for people. Vietnam has resumed its unilateral visa exemption policy for 13 countries, as the Southeast Asian country seeks to reopen its tourism industry after next to no foreign visitors. Citizens from countries that are eligible for an exemption are allowed to visit Vietnam for up to 15 days without visa, regardless of their passport type or entry purpose. An $88 billion investment by global chip-making giant Intel is now allowing the construction of a giant chip plant in Germany, hoping it will be the answer to allowing for less reliance on imports and preventing the supply crunch. 
Intel has picked Germany as the site for a huge new chip-making complex. It's among the first concrete plans announced as part of an $88 billion investment in Europe. The US chipmaker also said it would boost an existing factory in Ireland and set up a research and development facility in France and is in talks over a packaging and assembly site in Italy. Its initial investment will hit around $36 billion. That will help meet surging demand for chips used in computers, cars and other devices. Shortages of such silicon have dogged big manufacturers over the past year. The German complex will be sited in the city of Magdeburg, creating about 3,000 permanent jobs. Another 1,000 roles will be created at the French hub. Intel says it chose to work in multiple countries to avoid overexposure to one particular labour market. The firm may also hope to get more subsidies from different nations. Italy and others have offered big incentives to woo the company's investment. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. In case you have missed to watch any of the stories we aired tonight, you can always rewatch by catching us on our YouTube page, youtube.com slash English. Hindu devotees kicked off holy festival celebrations in India's northern Uttar Pradesh, state by dancing, singing and smearing colors on each other. We are leaving you tonight with visuals of these lively celebrations. Thank you for watching. Good night.